This morning, we have one of the most difficult topics to talk about. This is a tough one. In fact, I can write it down before I can even say it. Okay, so it's on the screen. Kids in the back seat while you're driving. <laughs> if you've ever had two kids in the back seat while you're driving, you deserve a medal. If you've had even one child in the back seat while you're driving, you deserve at least a participation ribbon. <laughs> Two in the back seat, a medal. Three or more, instant sainthood. <laughs> I know of which I speak, okay? Our eldest son, Jared, or Jay, was born in 86. Our daughter, Ruthann, or Rudy, was born in 88. Our son, Benjamin, or Ben, was born in 91. So when Ben was two, Rudy was five and Jay was seven. This is just a sampling of some true words we heard while we were taking trips in the car with the kids in the back seat. <laughs> Ben's leg is touching my leg. Yeah, that's what happens when there's three kids in the back seat. Rudy won't stop singing. It's true, that's what she did all the time. But our favorite, Jay's looking out my window. <laughs> now we laugh now, but I was looking for a blunt object to hit myself. Like, what do you do with this? You say, well, this is interesting, but what does this have to do with the text? Well, believe it or not, it's right here in the text. You say, with well, a me message paraphrase, maybe. Do you know Tim Hopkins says, Hawkins says that you can find the recipe for Rice Krispie Squares in the message translation? I don't know about that. But um, we always want to be helpful here at Belmont Village Church. So this is for parents, grandparents, child care providers of any kind. If you ever have children in the back seat, we're going to have a few minutes of community conversations in groups of three or four talk about this. What tips would you recommend when dealing with kids and their backseat bickering. Okay? Three or four people, just for a few minutes, go talk about that. Here on the screen is one of my favorite tips. Isn't that clever? Dividers. There's dividers. Dividers. And check out this necessity being the mother of invention. This is a real thing. You can actually go to the website, Backseat Wally. <laughs> Isn't that genius? Yes, it would be better if they got along and forgave and loved one another. But if that doesn't work, <laughs> this is an option. Well, this morning's message has to do with this, I promise. And here's the title of it. And honestly, I was thinking in youth, my youth pastor mind, I think, when I came up with this title, but God in the details of troublemaking tattletailers and a ponytail trim. And here are the images that go with it. You remember that great scene in Mr. Bean when the ponytail comes off? God in the details of troublemaking tattletailers and a ponytail trim. And as is our practice, we're going to walk expositionally through the text. And, and so we'll see this emerge. So in verse 12, when Gallio was proconsul in Achaia. Proconsul simply means he was the governor. He was the governor of a region called Achaia, which is modern day, anyone know? Modern day Greece. Modern day Greece. So to get a feel for the region of Achaia and what Gallio was responsible to Rome for, Let's consult the map again. Again, Paul's second missionary journey, uh, his route is in red. And there's Corinth, where Paul and his friends are right now, okay? Today in our short text, Paul's going south to Synchria. He's going east to Ephesus, southeast to Caesarea, south but up to Jerusalem, and we'll see why, and then north back home to Antioch. So here's a close-up of Achaia, and there's Corinth again. It was the capital of the region, so that's likely where Gallio was 
was headquartered. And notice this narrow area right here between Athens and, and Achaia. And here it is zoomed out. You can see the zoomed out picture. And today there's something called the Corinth Canal. It cuts across a peninsula called the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Just for fun, say that three times. <laughs> Peloponnesian Peninsula. This is a current aerial photo of the peninsula and the canal. But here's the thing. In Paul's day, the Peloponnesian Peninsula existed, but the Corinth Canal was not there. It was simply land. So here were the options for a ship. Either you sailed around Achaia, which is now Greece, which is about 322 kilometers, or you dragged the ship across that peninsula about 5.63 kilometers. And that's what many did. They would take the cargo off and carry it across, and then they pulled the ship up onto rollers and rolled it across the 5.63 kilometers. That was the thing. Can you imagine the, the man hours that went into that deal? But it was an economic boom for Corinth because Corinth was situated just about in the middle of the Peloponnesian Peninsula shipping lane. Okay, so that's some of the fascinating part we didn't have time for last Sunday, if you remember that. The point is this, Gallio was governor of all of that. Okay, he was overseeing all of that on behalf of Rome. And so it says, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul. Do you recall last time when we were in verse 10, 10b specifically, God promised Paul that no one is going to attack and harm you. So that promise is still valid. They're attacking, but he knows in his heart, because of God's promise, he will not be harmed. Then it says, then they brought him to the place of judgment, and that is the word bema, B-E-M-A. We've heard of the judgment seat of Christ. This is a reflection, a small reflection of the judgment seat of Christ. Don't have time to go into what that is. You can do some studying yourself. But it, here it means a raised platform where judgments took place. This was like official court. And, and what's happening here? The Jews of Corinth are tattletaling to Gallio, specifically to get Paul in trouble. That's what this is all about. Look at verse 13. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. We want you to do something about it. Now, before we look at this in the text, let me talk about kids again. There are no doubt differences of opinion about how to deal with tattletaling kiddos. When Karen and I were parenting, when one of our kids came to us with, I'll call it their version of the story, a particular story, we tried to discern what was actually happening. Was this child coming with a legitimate concern? Was this a safety issue? Was this a bullying? bullying situation, maybe even an egregious violation of decent childhood behavior. And if so, a thoughtful response from us in word or action was warranted. Sometimes, however, we simply discern that this, there was unnecessary drama due to other factors, a lack of sleep, hunger, or a more serious one. This child was not receiving enough of our attention. Sibling rivalry is often about a child rivaling their sibling for their parents' attention. But even when some of those factors were in play, was this a question of tattletaling with the underlying purpose of seeing their sibling get in trouble? Bring the law down on her dad. Let him have some corporal punishment, Mom. C can you hear it in the text? Paul's persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Bring the law down on him, Gallio. We want Paul to suffer. Well, when Gallio hears the word law, his mind goes to Roman law. But this is not that. 
They are talking about Jewish law, and so what's going to happen? Verse 14. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. Isn't this interesting? Paul has his mouth open. He's about to talk, but he didn't need to say a word. God, in the details, is going to come to Paul's defense. God's spirit is already working here through the mind and the will of a Roman government official who probably does not know Jesus. But God's spirit is working to defend Paul. Talk about the fulfillment of Proverbs 21.1. In the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels toward all who please him. I love that text. Now, is it always true in every situation? No. Proverbs is about probabilities. But this is what God can do. And so look at how Galio responds to their tattletaling, verse 15. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. We did that as parents. <laughs> we did. When our kids were tattletaling to get their sibling in trouble, we would say, like a judge, settle that matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. And we drove them off. We literally did that. That happened. In fact, we would say, if you're trying to get your brother or sister in trouble, it's not going to happen. In fact, you may be in danger of receiving what you hoped your sibling would receive. Yes, that could happen. Now, in the text, to be honest, there could be some anti-Semitism going on here. There likely is. In fact, look at the next verse. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul, and Gallio showed no concern whatever. He's anti-Semitic. He does not care that the Jews are fighting with themselves, and one of them gets beat up. He's fine with that, actually. But think about this crowd, this, this mob. They, they wanted blood. They didn't get it with Paul, and so they take it out on Sosthenes. Parents, heads up, this is a real thing. This can happen. When a kiddo doesn't get the kind of justice they're looking for, they can give that kind of justice to someone less powerful than themselves, one of their little siblings. Classic bullying motivation. May I say, if you're a parent or a grandparent, you've always got to choose your battles, but in matters of the will, around this issue, win and win decisively. It really matters to the well-being of, their, of, of your children. Well, Gallio's indifferent response is actually pretty horrible. It's, it's anti-Semitic. But I want you to notice something about Sosthenes. There's something so redemptive in this story. First of all, we know from 1 Corinthians that Sosthenes becomes a disciple of Jesus. And in fact, he's the second synagogue leader to put his faith in Jesus. We saw last week, Crispus, the first synagogue leader, was saved by God, and he was actually baptized by Paul. I'm thinking the best job for any Jewish person is to become the synagogue leader, because they're on a collision course with God's spirit and their salvation. It's two in a row. But secondly, check this out about Sosthenes. When Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth. Sosthenes, who takes this beating, maybe even before he is a believer, comes to faith in God, grows and matures in Christ, and co-labors with Paul in writing God's word to the Corinthians. How great is that? God against all odds does that, redeems the situation, this beating that Sosthenes takes. Amazing story. Have you ever endured a beating? Maybe physically, maybe emotionally, maybe financially, maybe someone took you, did something 
unjust, you did not deserve. There are many kinds of beatings that others can inflict on us. Listen, if God's got you, then God's got this. If God's got you, then God's got this. If you're his child, then we can know, we can experience his care and his plan that is at work in our lives, even though we might experience a beating. God was in the details. He was at work. Sincerely, give yourself fully to Jesus Christ as your Lord. Do that today and know his peace no matter what you're going through in life. Well, that's the story of God in the details of the troublemaking tattletailers. What about this ponytail trim? Well, have a look at verse 18. It says, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Now, Luke, he's a doctor, but he's also a really good historian, and he loves to put time stamps on things. And so this is the general time stamp. They stayed for a long time. We already know in verse 11, the specific time stamp, 18 months. Okay, so some people have confusion about, is this additional to the 18 months? I really think it coincides. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, which is where Ephesus is, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Then this curious statement. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sankria because of a vow he had taken. Well, before we get there, Priscilla and Aquila, isn't it interesting? They were introduced to us last time. First of all, they're Paul's friends. Then they're his co-workers, maybe his boss, bosses. And now they're his patrons. They're probably working away at tent making, supporting the ministry. But not only that, they're his partners in ministry. What a wonderful relationship. And we're going to see next week, again, Priscilla and Aquila and, and how they are disciple-making people. But here's the big question. What's happening here with Paul taking a vow? Well, in all likelihood, because of the hair reference, it is the vow of the Nazarite. And and by the way, that has nothing to do with Jesus of Nazareth. When I was a boy, I thought, oh, it's something to do with Jesus of Nazareth, Nazarite. Nothing at all. It's Numbers chapter 6. And so if you want to do the deep dive into what that is, feel free. But we are going to look at two things. What is it? And why did Paul take it? Why did Paul do it? Well, first of all, what is the vow of the Nazarite? And the most important thing to know is that it's all about three things. Devotion to God, dedication to God, and gratitude to God. That's what the vow of the Nazarite is about. And it involved abstaining from three things. So first of all, taking nothing from the vine. No wine. No grapes, no raisins, whatever else you can make from from, uh, the vine. So what what you're saying in this vow is, I'm taking a fast from celebrating. I'm denying myself that pleasure in order to get close to God and show him my devotion, dedication, and gratitude. Secondly, no exposure to a dead human or a dead animal. And what you were saying there was, I'm avoiding any serious impurity, exposure to death. And then thirdly, no cutting your hair. As a guy, you're saying, I'm taking a fast from what is culturally accepted. It it would take some humility and grace to deal with other people's potential opinions and statements about you as you were growing your hair long. And then lastly, when the vow was over, you would cut your hair, take that hair to Jerusalem, to the temple, and it would be burned as a sacrifice. Interesting, right? And we'll see in a few minutes that Paul really wants to get to Jerusalem as fast as possible to fulfill this vow. Well, that's what it is. Why is Paul taking the Nazarite vow? And there are so many opinions. Some people think Paul's slipping back into law-keeping. I don't think so. Is Paul uh, hanging on to his Jewish roots? Well, maybe. But is that a bad thing or a good thing? Paul was still Jewish. He was still part of the Jewish family. In fact, he was not anti-Jewish. He is expressing his Jewishness through this vow. But Paul... 
please hear me on this. This is so important even for our day. Paul continually did something with his Jewish identity that we need to continually do with each and every one of our earthly identities if we know Jesus. He submitted his secondary identity to God and saw it as subservient to his primary identity as a son in the family of God. That's what Paul meant when he said in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Do those identities still exist? Of course. Obviously, yes. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, they existed. Are they subservient identities to this new and primary identity as sons and daughters, members together in the body of Jesus Christ? Again, yes. So, beyond being Jewish, and more than simply a healthy discipleship activity, some, some scholars say it was just a discipleship thing, I think there's another reason why Paul took the vow. This may be a stronger theory. Now, as soon as you hear a preacher say theory, you probably think, wonderful things in the Bible we see, some of them put there by you and by me. I'm a little suspicious and skeptical of theories, like the recipe for Rice Krispie Squares in the message translation. The theory I'm about to share is quite plausible. Quite plausible. In verse 9 and 10, do you remember this? God promised Paul that, number one, he was going to be with him. That, secondly, no harm would come to Paul. And that God had a plan to save many people. And those promises profoundly encouraged Paul. Profound. I believe they brought him out of the funk that he was in. Do you remember we read last time, 1 Corinthians 2, 3. He came to them in weakness, in fear, in trembling. There was something deep going on in Paul when he arrived there. He was burnt out by all the abuse that he had suffered. But when he hears this encouragement from God, like, it's like he put the sails up and God filled them with wind. And he was ready to keep going. And out of that joy of coming out of that, that place he was in, this vow is Paul saying, thank you, God. I rededicate my life. I devote myself to you in gratitude. And so for a year and a half, I'm not going to enjoy wine. For a year and a half, I'll stay away and be pure from dead things. And for a year and a half, oh, my hair's going to look a bit gnarly, but I'm not cutting my hair. I just want to say Thank you, God. Whether this was Paul's reason or not, okay, we can ask him when we see him. I do believe that like Paul, we would do well to acknowledge the activity of God in our lives. What is the role that God takes in our life? And, and, and can we show gratitude for that? Let's conclude with what that might look like for us after we briefly look at these last four verses, okay? Verse 19. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Of course he did. Even though he had said, I'm leaving the Jews, I'm going to the Gentiles, his heart was still to the Jews, and so whenever there was a synagogue, he was there. Verse 20. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. It should have a question mark there. He declined. <clears throat> when did Paul ever decline an invitation to proclaim the gospel in a Jewish synagogue to Jewish people? Never. He is on a mission to get to Jerusalem because he wants to fulfill his vow. He wants to carry out his vow. It, it's so interesting to me, too, that in chapter 16, verse 7, God's Spirit did not permit Paul to go into Ephesus to preach. But here now he has permission, and the agency's Paul's. Paul has been given the permission and freedom to choose, and he chooses not to. But this is really important. Look what he says in verse 21. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if... It is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. It's beautiful. Paul shares his heart. 
that he really wants to be there. He wants to come back. But he says, if it is God's will. I could tell you, but I'd rather you do the study. Do a little study of how many times Paul says, if it is God's will. If it is God's will. It's a number of times. In concert with James, in James 4.15, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Do you hear what James is saying? It's God's will whether I breathe or not. It is God's will if we live, let alone do this or that. It's been so interesting on Mondays at the community center at the food program, a lot of Arabic speaking people, and I hear the words, Inshallah, a lot. If God's willing. Inshallah, God, God willing. Now, it's even more important, even more important than saying it, is that we live like we believe it. That everything we do is subject to God's will. And so that's where Paul is. So look what it says in verse 22. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch, which is so fascinating because up is usually north for us, right? But Antioch's north, and says, it says he went down to Antioch and he went up, which is south, to Jerusalem. And it's like, what is going on? It has everything to do with elevation, okay? Jerusalem is at about 2,500 feet or 780 meters above sea level. So even though it's south, it is up. And Antioch is, is down, even though it's north. And Caesarea is on the coast. It's about 100 kilometers west and north of Jerusalem. Well, why did Paul want to get to Jerusalem? Because he wanted to drop off his ponytail. He wanted to fulfill his vow and be done with that. And then it says he greeted the church. Where? At Jerusalem. This is now his fourth visit to Jerusalem. And then he goes back to Antioch. And do you realize this is completing his second missionary journey? Three years, 4,335 kilometers, 43-45 kilometers. What a trip. And Luke doesn't even take a breath. In verse 23, Paul begins his third missionary journey. <laughs> he literally did Now, there had to have been a bit of a break. Weeks, months, we don't know. But the next missionary journey is about to begin. We're going to give him a week off, okay? And we'll pick it up next time. But in closing, how might we show our gratitude, our devotion to God in our lives? And, and we could certainly open this up as a community conversation and it would be rich. We hear so many great answers. I have five I want to suggest. How could I recognize the role of God in my life and say thank you for it in practical ways that people might even notice Karen and I talked so much about this. It's not simply, you know, I'm going to fast from technology or food and no one's going to see it. That's not what the Nazarite vow was about. It was about people actually noticing. Well, here's one. Receive God's Son as your Savior and King. Like, that's the big one. That's the really big one. That is the maximum way that you and I can say, thank you, God, for everything that you have ever done in my life. I receive the gift that you're giving me in Jesus. When my grandfather, Benjamin uh, Connor, who our youngest son was named after, someday I will tell you his whole testimony, because he literally had 10 near-death experiences, legitimate. Stubborn, stubborn, hard-hearted man who once shook his fist at God and said, I don't need you because I'm strong on my own. And a year before he died, he'd had three embolisms that should have taken his life. And he was barely alive in Toronto. And my aunt went to see him and just, you know, cared for him and spoke really kindly to him and gave him a little Bible. And he said, thank you for the Bible. And she left. The next day, she came back and she tore a strip off him. She said, Benjamin Connor, you are such a stubborn old man. She had quite a fire in her. And she said, I gave you a Bible yesterday. And what did you say? He said, I, I said, thank you. That's what God's been trying to do for 73 years in your life. Give you a gift of his son. And you won't even say thank you. And she turned around and left. 
And that's exactly what God's spirit needed him to hear. It's exactly what he needed him to hear. Because the man who shook his fist at God literally couldn't even lift his arms. He was so weak. And he said, she's right. And lying on that bed, he said, thank you, God, for the gift of your son, Jesus. And a year later, he went home to heaven. Say that you will receive your, his son as your savior. And God says, I hear your appreciation. I hear your devotion to me. Well, secondly, how, practically, how could you remind yourself that I'm not my own? God is leading my life. Well, this one's right in front of you right now. Come to church. Be the church as a rhythm. Coming to church as a rhythm. As Hebrews 10.25 says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Isn't that an interesting word? It is a habit not to come to church. It is a habit to come to church. It is a habit of devotion, of gratitude. But encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And so when we come together, don't you feel encouraged when we gather together? That's what the church is and does. And so that's a way we can show our devotion. Well, here's another way. Be baptized. Be baptized. God invites you if you're a believer in Jesus, if you're a disciple of Christ, to be obedient. And he says, be baptized. And here's what obedience look like, looks like when it's from the heart. It's devotion. It is saying, thank you, God. I love you. I will do as you say. And so I will be baptized. And that's what it should look like. So if you're not baptized as a believer, would you consider being baptized? Well, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of time between Sunday to Sunday. And those kind of, those two and three kind of feel like Sunday things, right? What, what, what other practical ways? Well, here's a fourth one. A post-it note on your bathroom or bedroom mirror that simply says, remember. Remember. Remember who God is in your life. Remember whose will determines if you live today and what you will do today and each and every day. Remember. And then maybe a vow. You say, really? A Nazarite vow? Why not? Why not? You know, it's interesting at Passover, some of us celebrated Passover. Not religiously, but just we wanted to understand Passover and what it all was about. And there's many kind of Things like that. It's not about we have to do this to gain God's favor. No, this is a way of just expressing God's truth and reminding our hearts of what he's done. Well, what could a vow to God look like? It, it could be fasting, right? It could be. But what about something that others might see? Remember the Nazarite vow. We, I'll tell you a story in closing. We have a friend. Her name is uh, Faith. And she came to faith in Jesus when she was in her 30s, and her children were young and growing up, but she was in her 30s, and she really swung the pendulum. She had lived in the world. She had lived kind of a wild life, and so she swung the pendulum, and so it was kind of legalistic about a lot of things, and one of them was piercings. Any kind of ears or nose or any other parts of the body piercing. She was like, no, and my kids will never have this. And she looked down on any Christians who did. And, and then years went by, and faith really grew in grace a lot. And she was pretty convicted about that position she'd had. And she talked to all her kids, and she talked to any of her friends she'd ever said it to. But then she felt God just really prompting her. And she, so she took a vow for a year that she would have a nose piercing. And she did. And at first she was like so embarrassed and awkward and feeling like everyone's looking at my nose. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But she wore that nose piercing. And it was so meaningful to faith. And a year later, she, she took it out. She didn't necessarily want it. It wouldn't have been a bad thing if she had. But she so identified with God's grace in her life. 
And that year of devotion and dedication and gratitude was one of the most meaningful years in her life. Through a nose piercing, through a vow, through a vow of dedication to God. I don't know what it looks like to you, but here's what I do know. Here's the bottom line. All of us in this room and online have some form or some level of relationship with Jesus. You say, I I'm not a Christian yet. You still have a relationship with Jesus. There is some way you're relating to him. It could be you're pushing him away. It could be your back is toward him. We all have some level. But here's the other thing we have. We have two things in our life. One is an altar and one is a throne. And when we put ourselves on one of those, we put Jesus on the other one. If we put ourselves on the throne, then we are putting Jesus on the altar. And here's the harder truth. When we put Jesus on the throne, we put ourselves on the altar. That's the hard one. See, we feel sadness if we put ourselves on the throne and Jesus on the altar. We're, we're sad. We've got to overcome sadness. But you know what we've got to overcome the other way? Stubbornness. Because it's hard to put ourselves on the altar. But you know what makes it easier? When we put him on the throne. When we actually focus on that. Don't focus on you on the altar. Focus on him on the throne. And the altar part kind of takes care of itself. That's, that's where Paul was. That's where Paul was. That's where you and I need to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love your word. It's deeply convicting and profoundly revealing. But thank you for it. It is your grace in our lives that you are so truthful. And God, it comes from your heart of love, pure, unadulterated love. So Father, may we respond today with the little mustard seed of faith that we may have. May we respond today and may we just reach out. And may we just reach out to you as we know how in this moment and just simply say, Jesus, I put you on the throne of my life. I will acknowledge you. I will remember that my life is in your hands and that whatever plans I have are all in your hands, in your control. I give all of that to you. I submit all of who I am to all of who you are. Help us to do that, God. Some are fighting it today. We want many areas of our life to be submitted to Jesus, but not that area, not this area. God, convict us until we're ready to say all, all on the altar for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.